Okay, students, we're going to start talking about uh, chapter 17. And we needed to remember the information from chapter 6 and our understanding of enthalpy to help us in this particular chapter. So let's just review what we did. We looked at delta H of reaction. And what we said was that um, we could do one of two things. We could predict the sign of delta H. So for example, in our ice cube example, when it um, melts, we know that delta H is positive. We know that that's an endothermic process. We know that heat is absorbed from the surroundings to make that ice cube, help that ice cube to melt. So one of the things that we talked about in the previous videos was that there are certain things like phase changes, combustion, dissolving of salts, that as students, you should know whether they're endo or exothermic at this point. So that's one thing. The other thing that we learned was that we can find delta H of reaction by taking the sum of the co uh, of the excuse me of delta H of formation of products with their coefficients in mind minus the sum of the delta H of formation of reactants. So we started to use the thermodynamic tables in the back of your book, and we're going to continue to use those in this section. Okay. So where are we headed? Oh, the other thing too that we did was we talked about the process in a car. And I'm just gonna keep coming back to that as kind of a good example of something that we're familiar with in real life. Because a lot of the information that we're studying came from engineers thinking about how they were going to convert enthalpy heat into mechanical work. So one of the things that we talked about in, a in the previous videos was that we'll think of our octane as our system. And for sure, this is exothermic. We could try to look it up using the tables in the back of the book. Most of them don't have the octane value that we need. But the more, the more carbons in a hydrocarbon, the more energy is given off for the delta H. And uh, so this is exothermic. And we said that for this process, some of the heat will go into mechanical work to turn the wheels of your car. But then some is useless for that and is transferred. The heat is transferred to the surroundings. And what that does is it increases the number of microstates, the arrangements, that the air molecules can have, and that's gonna increase the entropy of the surroundings. So as heat flows into the surroundings, we see that for this exothermic process, there's an increase in the entropy of the surroundings. So that's where we're at with the last video slides. And now what we're gonna do in this section is talk a lot more about what entropy is, how we can find it for a reaction, how it plays in with enthalpy, delta H. And then we're going to start to think about 
something called um, spontaneous, spontaneity or spontaneous, spontaneous reactions. So a spontaneous process occurs without external intervention. So you, you don't have a constant intervention. So for example, um, some of the combustions, you know, they require us to light a match or have a spark. But once that's done, they'll still, that process is spontaneous. It'll keep going. So um, remember for the case of some of the combustions that are exothermic, when you provide them with that input of energy, that's to overcome this activation energy. But overall, the process is exothermic. And then what we're going to see is that in addition to that, that process is spontaneous. And we're going to come back to that in just a second. So spontaneous means that it occurs without external intervention, no need for constant intervention. Uh, some spontaneous processes are fast or slow. Um, the ones that we've done in lab that have been spontaneous. So like when you put sodium chloride in water, it dissolves, uh, are, is very fast. It's also spontaneous, but some spontaneous processes can be very, very slow. So it's independent. Spontaneity is independent of the kinetics. Okay, that statement at the bottom there, to determine spontaneity, we need both enthalpy and entropy. So we need both delta H and something called delta S, and we'll talk more about how we find those. So we need both. So just because a process is exothermic doesn't mean it's spontaneous, and endothermics can also be spontaneous. So what factors in will be the entropy component, okay? There is an important concept here regarding spontaneity, and that is that for a process to be spontaneous, <coughs> excuse me, the entropy of the universe has to increase. And the entropy of the universe is the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings. So this is called, this is the second law of thermodynamics. We need that dramatic music. The first law was the law of conservation of energy, right? Energy can't be created nor destroyed. It can be interconverted. Second law is that in a spontaneous process, there's always an increase in the entropy of the universe. And so here's our equation, delta S of the universe, so that's our entropy value, is equal to delta S of the system and delta S of the surroundings. So what we're going to do in the next few slides is break this up and ask the question, what determines delta S? of the system, what determines delta S of the surroundings? And see if we can figure out then, because if we know both, then we can decide whether or not the delta S of the universe is increasing or not. Okay, so, um, before we do that, so if delta S of the universe is positive, the entropy of the universe is, increases and the process is spontaneous as written. Delta S of the universe is negative, the process is spontaneous in the opposite direction. And then if delta S of the universe is zero, then your system is in equilibrium. Okay. Okay, so entropy 
capital S, is a thermodynamic function that describes the number of microstates that are available in a system. So I like that word microstates. So we can try to think of this in terms of molecular randomness or disorder. Now, as I mentioned to you, all of this was, is rooted in a lot of math that is not being shown. It comes from the study of heat flow in engines. And so the idea of molecular randomness is good and it does play a role, but um, those people that are really into this side of science they understand that it's all very, very mathematical from studying heat flow. And uh, one of the things I didn't like about your the section in your book is that it starts to kind of simplify it so much. So I know there's a section that talks about a deck of cards, how messy your room is. Please like ignore that because this was all from looking at heat flow and engines and, and then thinking about all the math behind that and then it's been applied towards other discussions but it never really does get to the point where talking about it with deck of cards is a great way of doing it okay so keep that in mind as we keep going okay so nature's going to want to go towards states where there's more possibilities for how molecules can be arranged. So for example, this is just an example. If we take a, an ideal gas and uh, we open up uh, these two that are in, uh, well, this side of the gas, it's in this side of the bulb. If we open up the, this valve, then the gas will disperse itself. And that's because there's more randomness when it does that. It's gonna to go to more microstates, more possibilities for how they can arrange. Uh, this is trying to get you more pictures to think of this. Uh, each configuration gives a particular arrangement uh, the probability of occurrence depends on the number of microstates, which the arrangement can be achieved. And so there's going to always be a tendency then to try to pick the arrangements in nature, to try to go towards the arrangement. We have more possibilities for how those molecules can be arranged. Okay, so in the first example, arrangement one, there's only one microstate, one possibility, but in two, there's four different possibilities. Okay, and, that, and you can imagine if you have Avogadro's number of molecules, how, how many possibilities there's going to be. This is a very simplistic model here then, right? Okay, and in the third arrangement, there's six microstates. So hopefully you're getting the picture that the tendency of molecules is going to want to be, in this example, towards the one with the greater number of possible microstates or arrangements. Okay, so let's talk about solids and liquids and gases. This one's, I think, easier than the last one. Um, a solid is a highly organized packed structure, a liquid's less right organized, and then the gas is a lot more free form. And so this one's a lot easier to visualize the whole idea of microstates because in a gas, you're going to be able to move around and be in all sorts of different positions. So we see then we have a, a greater, um, entropy and positional there is just trying to qualify it that it's the entropy of the molecules locations and we see a de decrease in entropy towards the solid okay so why will this be important is that there's going to be some processes where you can eyeball predict 
what's going on with the entropy of that system. So in this case, um, going from solid to liquid to gas, for sure, going this way, we would see an increase in the entropy of the system. Okay, so there's going to be scenarios that we can predict it based on what we know about the arrangement of molecules. Um, if you are mixing two things together, uh, then you're going to see that a, an entropy change is going to be increasing. It's going to be positive. So for example, if I have some water and I drop into it sodium chloride solid, for sure those ions floating around in there now, they're going to have a lot more random, more microstates to adopt. And that process, we would say that the entropy of that system is increasing. Okay, so here's a way to testing ourselves. We wanna compare higher positional ent entropy per mole at a given temperature, solid CO2 versus gaseous. For sure, gas phases would have a higher entropy. And then if I have two gases, one's at one atmosphere and the other one's at a much lower pressure, the lower the pressure, the higher the volume of the gas, right? And the bigger volume, the more possible arrangements that gas is going to have. And this is the written part for that. Okay, so take a minute. You can pause me and read. Uh, predict the sign of the entropy change for each of the following. So you have solid sugars added to water to form a solution. And iodine vapor condenses on a cold surface to form crystals. So go ahead and think about those before you move on. And then the answers will come up. Okay, so what we want to do now is, now that we have kind of a feeling for what the term means, is we want to be able to ultimately understand delta S of the universe equals delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. And so what we're going to do now is address each of these separately. Now, when I highlight it like that, what I want you to think about is that uh, they're both going to be um, determining what happens to our spontaneity because for spontaneous processes, Delta the S of the universe is positive. So what determines that is going to be how big Delta S of the system is compared to Delta S of the surroundings and also what sign they are. Are they positive or are they negative? So let's start first by addressing Delta S of the surroundings and asking the question, what is going to determine its magnitude, how big it is, and what sign it is. And the answer to that goes back to whether or not it is an exothermic process or endothermic. So number one key concept right now is delta H determines Delta S of surroundings. Okay, and I already kind of hinted at this because remember when we talked about that car with the 
system being exothermic, the heat flows into the surroundings. And what did I say at that time and what did we talk about was that that heat might be useless for doing work but it's going to make the surrounding air molecules move around like crazy. And what's that going to do to the microstates is it's going to increase the number of microstates in the surroundings. And this is always going to happen when you have an exothermic process. So exothermic processes always increase delta S the surroundings. Okay, conversely, if you were to have, and I'm gonna erase this other one here, Okay, if we have a process where it heat flows into the system, so endothermic, think about heat flowing into the system. Well, now what's gonna happen is you're gonna decrease the number of microstates in the surroundings. So endothermic processes always decrease delta S of the surroundings. So number one key concept, and it's only half of our picture coming back up here, delta S of the surroundings is determined by enthalpy, heat. Okay. So delta S of the surroundings depends on the direction of heat flow. At constant temperature, delta S of the surroundings for exothermic is always positive. And delta S of surroundings for endothermic is always negative. And so the sign depends on endo or exo how big the number is for delta S of the surroundings will depend on temperature. So there is an equation here, delta S of the surroundings is equal to negative delta H over T. Okay, and what that means is that, um, the temperature does play a role. It's gonna determine how big the number is. And then the other thing that you should realize when you look at the equation then, so if you have a reaction that's exothermic, so if delta H is negative, delta S of surroundings is always positive because we said when heat flows out into the surroundings, those molecules are gonna have more um, uh, possibilities for how they can arrange so the entropy will always go up. If delta H is positive, endothermic, the surrounding molecules will always become less random, more organized. Okay, so are you missing buffers yet? Okay, so um, let's talk about, so let's go back up here, delta S of the universe, delta is equal to delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. And we just decided that the what's determining delta S of the surroundings will be negative delta H over T. So whether it's endo or exothermic and what temperature you're at. Okay, now we have to 
analyze delta S of the system. And delta S of the system, it's going to be two ways that we think about it. One is we try to predict its sign. Previous slides. When you have solids that go to gases, the entropy of the system goes up. When you mix a salt and water, the entropy of the system goes up. So we can, in a lot of processes, we could predict the sign of delta S of the system. Not always, but a lot of the times. So kind of recapping, so when you go from solid to liquid to gas, Delta S of the system is positive. Okay, when we go from a uh, salt as a solid and now we've dissolved it in water, Delta S of the system is increasing. So for a lot of processes, we can take a look at their signs and determine Delta S, but if we want to do this more mathematically and carefully, then we can use the thermodynamic tables in the back of your book because entropy is a state function. The path a process takes doesn't matter just where it starts and where it ends. And so we can use a reaction or a formula that's real similar to what we practice with enthalpy. We can use the thermodynamic tables in the back and subtract the entropy of the products minus entropy of the reactants. But those are the sums, sums of the product minus sums of the reactants. And N is the coefficients, right, that you need in, in the balanced equation. So the math is the easy part here. The concepts are more challenging. Okay. So uh, these are just examples of our system. So let's say, um, uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I meant to get rid of that slide. All right, so let's calculate uh, delta S of the system for this reaction. Okay, and so here are the entropy values from the back of the textbook. These come, just as a side note, from the third law of thermodynamics. Which is that the entropy of a perfect crystal is equal to zero. And so these values are, the, the reference point is that third law. Okay, that's okay. And in, in this course, we're not gonna really look at the derivation of these. I just wanted you to know that there is this third law, but I normally don't ask about it, but I do want you to know that these values are all based on determinations of comparing these substances to their perfect crystalline structures. Okay, so if I want to know the entropy of the system at 25 degrees for this reaction, I was I use these thermodynamic values and it's pretty easy. So what we'll do is we'll take products minus reactants. So I'm going to take two times, right? There's a two here times this number plus two times nickel two oxide minus two times the nickel two sulfide plus three times the oxygen. Note that because the reference is different and this is defined differently, that for um, the elements in their standard states, they will not have a zero here like they did with the enthalpy values because um, these are measured compared to their using third law. So this actually will have a number to it. So 
you can double check because you can go back and listen to it again. But we take two times SO2, which is here at 248, plus two times NO, which is here, minus um, the uh, reactants. I don't like how they showed it here. This is really confusing. Um, I would have done it like this. I don't know why they distribute it like that. I would have done this where I would have taken, I won't write everything out if that's okay. I would have just said two times 248 plus two times 38 minus uh, two times SO2 plus three times 205. What they did was so funky, they distributed that negative. And that's why you see how they distributed it. I've never seen a book do that. It's very strange. Okay, the other thing I want you to notice is the units for entropy. I should have said that earlier. These values, the units are joules per Kelvin per mole. And then because you're using the coefficients, those represent moles, so these ones would cancel. So our units for entropy ultimately is um, joules Kelvin. Okay, in this case, the entropy of the system is very negative, or negative, it's not very, but negative. And that means that we see a decrease in the entropy of that system. Something was going on there that um, made for more organization, less random. Now, what was it was that the number of gas molecules decreased. And when that happens, there's going to be less randomness and you're going to see a decrease in the entropy of the system. The other thing I should also mention is this not symbol here. That's because we're using the standard state conditions in the back of your book. Okay. Okay, so let's see if we can predict the sign. And then I will let you guys use the tables in your back of your book to come up with the entropy of the system using products minus reactants. And see if you get the same answer, it's a good exercise. So here on this side, we have three moles of gas. And on this other side, we have only two moles of gas. So for sure, that's a decrease in the entropy of the system, less random. Okay, on the second one, two moles of gas to three moles of gas. So that's an increase in the entropy of the system. And on the last one, we have three moles of gas to three moles of gas. So that one's going to be a, kind of a wash. You know, it's going to be very uh, difficult for us to eyeball. And then we'll see the number once you calculate it. So you should pause me right now and take out your book and calculate products minus reactants and um, see if what we predicted matches the number you got. So for the first one, we should get a negative number. For B, we should get a positive number. And for the third one, it should be a very, it probably maybe around zero, but close, you know, could be a little bit positive, a little bit negative. So let's see what we get. So pause me. The top one for sure is negative. Delta S is negative 186. The second one is positive. And the third one uh, came out to be 138, a little bit bigger than I thought, uh, but 
we can't we couldn't really predict it okay Okay, so um, when we're looking at this particular slide, this is sort of an exciting slide, which is that we now get to pull it together to ask the question, what is up with the delta S of the universe? So for the delta S of the system, we were looking to understand, is it going to be positive or negative, more or less random? For delta S of the surroundings, and let me use a different colored pen on these. So for the delta S of the system, is it more or less random? And then for the delta S of the surroundings, what determines that is endo or exothermic and temp. Okay, together, these guys decide whether or not delta S of the universe is positive or negative. And if delta S of the universe is positive, then the process is spontaneous and happens without an outside constant source of energy. Okay, so the first one. And I kind of see this slide as kind of the meaning of chemistry life, but there's an easier way of doing this, which we'll see a little bit later. <coughs> so delta S, if delta S of the system is positive, becoming more random, and the surroundings is also becoming more random, that's be and that's because it's exothermic on that, then the process is always spontaneous. A good example of an always spontaneous would be combustions. Exothermic processes where you're burning stuff and making a whole bunch of gas molecules. Another possibility, scenario two, the system's becoming more organized, decrease in entropy. It's endothermic. That is not good because that's not going to be spontaneous. It's not product favored. The reaction occurs in the opposite direction. We don't really like that kind of reaction, especially in lab, because it means it's not going to work well for us. So, oops, I meant to erase. So those are reactions that are hard to do as written. And then you have the last two scenarios where the two things are opposing each other. You have in the third one, a process that's becoming more random, but is endothermic. So what's going to decide this is temp. Because temp's gonna decide how big delta S of the surroundings is. And the last one would be a, a process that its entropy is decreasing, usually not favorable, right? But um, it's exothermic. Again, temperature will decide. Okay, so I know this is a lot to take in, uh, but what it, all of this is really saying is Every single reaction you've ever done in chemistry falls into these categories, one of them. You've done combustions, it's the first one. We haven't done much on the second one because they don't like to go forward. So that's, that's kind of a bust. 
And then the last two you've done. So let me give you an example. See if I can write on the next yeah, slide. So an ice cube. I like the ice cubes, don't I? It's the only thing I can draw. That one's not my best drawing. I'm sorry, I'm gonna redraw it because I was gonna be all braggy about how good I am at trying ice cubes and messed up. Okay, so here's our ice cube. That was better. And so let's think about it. You take it out of your fridge. There's no way I'm drying a fridge. Freezer, sorry. And we're gonna pull it out of the freezer and you know for a fact it is going to melt. So that is a spontaneous process. When you pull that ice cube out of the freezer, it's going to melt. Okay, so I'll show it melting. Okay, so with this in mind, let's think about what's going to happen here. What I'd like you to do is to first ask yourself, what is going to happen to the entropy of the system? Is it more or less organized? And then what I want you to think about is whether or not it's endo or exothermic. So I'm going to get a different color pen. So we've had a little bit of time to think. You can pause me if you need more time. The system's entropy is for sure positive because the water is becoming more random and it's possible microstates and arrangements going from a solid to a liquid. For sure, this process is endothermic. Okay, it takes heat to melt the ice cube. So looking and thinking about, let's bring it together now. So this is the exciting part. This is the part we've been waiting for. That's my excited face. We can put this together and ask the question, what's going to happen with delta S of the universe? So delta S of the system is positive. That is pulling and pushing to make delta S of the universe positive. Oops. And that's wants it to be spontaneous. Okay. Now let's see what delta S of the surroundings is. This is an endothermic process. Delta S of the surroundings is negative delta H over T. So if this number is positive, but the sign is negative, then what's going to happen is delta S of the surroundings is always negative for this. Always. So now we have a scenario where they are competing to decide who's bigger, who's going to win out. Because the system wants this to be spontaneous, but the fact that it's endothermic is kind of ruining that. So the question is, these guys are battling it out. Who's going to win? Well, what do you think is going to decide it? What decides when that or what decides whether that ice cube's going to melt? Ten, 
temperature does. So this is the thermodynamic process that is temperature dependent. That's when this entropy of the system and surroundings are battling it out to see which one's going to win out. So in that case, they oppose each other. Um, we could do another common example, sodium chloride aqueous, you know, dissolving a salt in water. So you could think of it that you have water put the salt in. For sure, delta S of the system is positive, becoming more random. Now, delta H of the system is also positive because it takes heat to dissolve salts. Almost all of them are like that. There's some exceptions, so, but most of them are like that. So, if delta H is positive endothermic, then delta S of the surroundings is always negative, and we're back to that temperature dependent. Okay, and it doesn't have to be a particularly high temp or low temp, because we know at room temperature, if you put salt in water, it's gonna dissolve spontaneously. So, Delta S of the universe is greater than zero. Sodium chloride dissolves spontaneously if the temperature is right. Okay, just like that ice cube, it's going to spontaneously melt if you take it out of the freezer. You're just going to watch it melt. You don't have to do anything special to it because the temperature is right. Okay, and these are the various possible combinations of delta H and delta S. I, if I was to summarize, this is the most important part of the chapter. Okay. And it's something that we'll go through in the Zoom office hours. We'll have, I'll give you different scenarios. Okay, I'm gonna stop this presentation right here. And where we're headed is a much easier equation to describe spontaneity. Well, maybe, Maybe I'll just keep going. Let me see where we're at in the PowerPoint. Okay, yeah, I think I'm just gonna stop here.